because I would like you to concentrate. Okay, right. <coughs> One of the last major areas on IT information governance <coughs> is the field of business continuity management. And we have just seen a spectacular success of business continuity planning and management uh, over the weekend. I mean, I guess most of you are aware that starting at the, early in the weekend, we had a major attack on the university, a ransom attack. And someone managed to slip a document through to somebody in the university with an attached Word file or Word document, which they unfortunately clicked, opened up, and then clicked on the little button that popped up saying, if you'd like this translated into something or other, press this button. They did, and that triggered one of these very nasty file encryption programs, which for some reason, rather than starting at the C drive and working along the list that way, i.e. encrypting the, hard, the PC, it started at, the, at Z and worked forward. So it started encrypting, which is very unusual, network files. As it happened, they caught it by the time it had encrypted 110,000 files on the network. Neat. Right. Neat. <laughs> However, and this is where the, the sort of real demonstration of business continuity planning and management uh, happens, they had done a ma massive update one hour before the attack started. So having stopped it, or closed it down, knowing that it happened, it was then relatively easy to restore all of the encrypted files from the backup. So here is a great demonstration of the real importance of, how, of that part of a business continuity plan. It was a brilliant piece of work and our, our colleagues in IT services are to be commended for the spectacular success of what they've done. Would that be classed as a redundancy? No, that's not redundant. Redundancy is something completely different. You expect backup. Redundancy <coughs> happens more, for example, in the banking environment, <coughs> where you will have two parallel environments running together okay. um, so in case the other, right. one of them falls over. Um, part of, I mean, I know of one bank uh, where they have the master somewhere, some very fortified area, and then the backup environment is at the bottom of an old, uh, near the bottom of an old gold mine. So it doesn't matter what goes on upstairs, you know, you could have riots and civil disorder and everything, and it's still totally safe. So, kind of different. Unless it's more men. No, it's compared to more men. safe. <laughs> Are you doing any business uh, school modules this year? You're not, are you? So we didn't ignore that one. By the way, did anybody sort of follow up on the um, risk, benefits, and uncertainty management concepts over the week as you started researching for your finalizing bits for your article? Uh, Such as briefly, the, the main takeaway I got was um, that risk management is kind of calculated, you can kind of make assumptions as to what the likelihood of something happening is, and then prepare it for the worst case scenario within that. Whereas in sponsorship <coughs> management is where you're not sure at all what the likelihood of it's going to be. And I also think it's a better approach to take. Which? That, um, uncertainty. Yeah. yeah. Why? I guess with risk management, that's just things you think might happen, whereas uncertainty, it kind of covers all bases, including that, and also things that you wouldn't predict. Yeah. So essentially having a fail safe everywhere and possible. Yeah, you know, I think you put your finger on it about risk management. We think we can calculate. But as we have no idea how to calculate the actual risk, really, without lots of statistics, and the estimate what's its consequence, what's the cost of the consequence is kind of a bit iffy as well, a bit uncertain. Using the mathematics or the arithmetic really only gives us some spurious um, feeling of accuracy. It's a bit like if, in your, in, if you were doing uh, 
questionnaire-based research with a Likert scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree with something neutral in the middle. It, we end up with a score from 0 to 5 or 0 to 10 or whatever. And then we do all sorts of statistical arithmetic on it and we think we've done quantitative analysis. Well, yes and no. Because strongly agree through to strongly disagree is kind of very, very subjective. How do, does anybody know that my number seven, whatever that is, is the same as your number seven, or it should actually, my number seven equate to your eight or your seven, or six, or five? And so we have to be very careful about the spurious uh, quantitative capability of some of these, some very, very subjective things. And risk assessment, uh, risk percentages assignment is a very, very subjective affair. So I think you're probably quite right there. The uncertainty management is probably going to become one of the more interesting, more valuable techniques in the future. Now, there's a really excellent British standard on business continuity called uh, ISO 2599, or British standard 2599, it's the same numbers these days. And it defines business continuity as this. All about organisations being able, both at strategic and tactical, either broad direction of where we want to go, and this is how we're going to fix a particular thing, to plan and respond to various incidents, like the one I just mentioned. And there's lots and lots of disrupt possible disruptions which can happen to businesses that will cause things to go really pear-shaped. And the idea is, with business continuity, is to make sure that it's pretty much reduced or mitigated to this acceptable level. The management of business continuity <coughs> is defined here. I'll leave you to read it. <coughs> and this is all about the process and uh, policies that you put into place in the organisation. So that whatever happens, you can keep the business running. And if you think about the fact that more and more organisations are being pushed into using Office 365 on the web, this is kind of okay until the man in a yellow digger strikes, or the denial of service attack happens at the other end, or at our end. And then suddenly the question is, what on earth are our staff going to do while they can't get at their email system, while they can't get at their word processing system or whatever else they're doing in Office 365. Do you send them home for the day because there's nothing they can do? How do you stop those sort of things? You can solve a lot of the problem with the man in the blue digger and <clears throat> those sort of things by having multiple uh, pipes into your organisation. But what you can't prevent or cope with is if Microsoft servers get hidden because of a, di a distributed denial of service attack. That's kind of interesting. So it's keeping the business going under almost all feasible circumstances. So the first bit of research I want you to do in a minute or two is to start off with getting, and again, very occasionally I say go use Wikipedia because you can get some interesting insights from there. You can't cite them, you can't reference them but use it to get an overview of these three topic areas. Then go to British Standards Online, as you know how to do, and get hold of ISO 27, uh, 2599 and any other relevant standards relating to business continuity. And then thirdly, you will find out there on the web lots and lots of professional organisations who have their websites around the field of business continuity management, business con continuity planning, and so on. Find three of them that claim to support business continuity professionals and start having a look at what sort of things they each say. Out of that, again, 
building your bibliography, working bibliographies you go, and then understanding what these different sources that I've just shown you on that previous slide have to say about the definitions, about the advice and the professional practices. Define what business continu continuity planning is about and see what sort of differences there are between those three levels that we had a look at just there. What is business continuity? What is the planning of business continuity? And what is the management of business continuity? Because they're three different things that lead from one through to the other. And then also have a look at the question of, if we look at those three definitions, then also connect them to your three um, professional websites of, about business continuity management and planning. How do those organisations actually define what they want you to do and how they develop the standards of the people who are members of their organisations? That leads you to another area that's really important. What are going to be the most critical tasks that need to be undertaken to build a proper business continuity plan and then think about the culture, the way we do things here is what that really means in an organisation to be effective in terms of developing really strong business continuity planning and management. So we've got a whole set of things here about what it is what processes need to be in place, what are the tasks that those processes should drive us to do and how often, and what sort of culture do we need to build to make this successful. And as you ask that some of those questions, you may well want to refer back to the Zachman Enterprise Architecture that some of you covered in the second year in IT Services Management. <coughs> where the six critical questions are who, how, why, what, where, when, and perhaps the seventh one, which is how much, i.e. the cost. They will help you to ask some important questions about intent, actual capability, timing, organisation, and so on. And then, when you've done all of that, now you need to start thinking about finding some great case studies that are out there, whether in the academic um, materials or business materials. Three good case studies of where it has really worked successfully. <coughs> and then find the opposite side, case studies or reports in the press of where business continuity wasn't properly implemented or just didn't exist at all, or failed to protect an organisation. As a clue, one good example would be from 9-11 when the Twin Towers fell and one of the financial services organisations in there, at the top of the tower, somewhere in the tower, had their entire backup site on the same square underneath one of, in one of those other buildings which also collapsed. So they had their business wiped out, they had their backup servers wiped out, and oh dear. So we need to get the examples of those ways of making it work really well, and where it hasn't worked, and why it didn't work, or what had happened, had they just not really thought things through adequately, because we need to have both, both sides of the coin. And as you look at those examples of the good case studies and the bad case studies, you know, what is it in each of those three, in, in the two, pair, uh, two sets, that are similar? Are there similar themes? Because if we can find similar themes, that's going to help us to really understand what's going on here. Similarities and themes in terms of failures. And then, even more importantly, what are the differences between those two sets of case studies? What was it that made the successful ones successful? What was it that made the unsuccessful ones probably catastrophic? 
So that's the real task. Now, why is this relevant? Well, first of all, it's important in the general terms of sustainable information governance. But you may need to incorporate some of these ideas in your assignment as you develop the idea or ideas around your article and the topic that you're looking at. So I would expect, and I, basically there's a comment about all of the week's sessions, that each of them, A, is important purely as an academic and a management exercise. You know, it's just things you need to understand. But it's also, I do expect to see elements of each of these week's activities coming into the assignment, because that's what ends up with that great policy that you come up with. Okay, guys, thanks. Off you go.